JPM in Japan. Welcome to Newsroom Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Let's start with the headlines. The anti-nuclear weapons group ICANN has received the Nobel Peace Prize, accompanied by an A-bomb survivor. Muslims are keeping up angry protests against the U.S. president's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. Japan, the U.S., and South Korea are holding a naval drill to simulate tracking a North Korean ballistic missile. People on the Indonesian island of Bali are growing more concerned about the impact of a volcano on tourism. And on today's Focus, a pro-democracy activist who once served as a close aide to Aung San Suu Kyi talks about the Rohingya refugee crisis and the future of democracy in Myanmar. At the Nobel Peace Prize award ceremony in Oslo, the head of an anti-nuclear weapons NGO and an atomic bomb survivor called for a world without nuclear weapons. The NGO won for its work towards a landmark UN treaty to ban nuclear arms, which was adopted in July. Beatrice Finn is the executive director of the International Campaign to Abolish Nuclear Weapons, or ICANN. Setsuko Thorlo is a survivor of the 1945 Hiroshima atomic bombing and has campaigned with the group. The chair of the Norwegian Nobel Committee praised the Geneva-based NGO's achievements. Finn and Thurlow then received the Nobel Diploma and Medal. And to all nations around the world, choose the end of nuclear weapons over the end of us. This is the choice that the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons represents. Join this treaty to all citizens of the world. Stand with us. Demand your government's side with humanity and sign this treaty. We will not rest until all states have joined on the side of reason. Thurlow then gave the first speech by an atomic bomb survivor, or Kibaksha, at a Nobel Prize award ceremony. These weapons are not a necessary evil. They are the ultimate evil. Our light now is a ban treaty. To all in this hall and all listening around the world, I repeat those words that I heard in the ruins of Hiroshima. Don't give up, keep pushing, keep moving. See the light, crawl towards it. The ambassadors of the United States, Russia, and other major nuclear-armed countries did not attend the ceremony. 56 countries have already signed the UN Treaty of the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, which ICANN helped adopt. But nuclear powers such as the U.S. and Russia, and countries under their nuclear umbrellas like Japan, oppose the treaty. Terumi Tanaka was among atomic bomb survivors, or Hibaksha, who attended the ceremony. He's pleased ICANN has received the Nobel Peace Prize, but he also feels increasingly frustrated as little progress is being made towards achieving the goal of nuclear abolition. Tanaka attended the ceremony on behalf of all Hibaksha at the invitation of ICANN. There are still countries with nuclear weapons that adamantly refuse to give them up. We've been trying hard for half a century to convince them, but haven't been successful. Tanaka survived the atomic bombing of Nagasaki when he was 13. He lost five relatives all at once. For nearly half a century, he's led a campaign to eliminate nuclear weapons as a leading member of a Hibaksha group. As time passes, Tanaka keeps losing Hibaksha friends one after another. He's concerned that soon there will be no one who personally knows the dread of nuclear weapons. This sense of crisis has driven his motivation. We had initially thought there would be fewer nuclear weapons as time went by. 
But that never happened. Instead, they kept growing in number. Kibaksha, atomic bomb survivors, struggled all their life and died one after another. I just can't forget their suffering. Tanaka took part in an international conference to discuss the banning of nuclear arms. Everywhere, many victims with heavy injury and hundreds of dead bodies were left unattended. It was literally hell. The Hibakusha experience must be the departure point when we discuss the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Tanaka's words helped increase momentum for the treaty's adoption. The signing ceremony for the landmark treaty was held in September, but Japan was not among the attendees. Tanaka is irritated that the Japanese government didn't even join the negotiations for the treaty. I'll keep calling for Japan's participation in the treaty as the only country to have suffered atomic bombings. The Japanese government says the treaty is not a realistic approach to nuclear disarmament. North Korea's nuclear and ballistic missile issues pose a grave threat that's highly imminent. So the Japanese government considers it very important for U.S. nuclear weapons to provide deterrence. We first want nuclear powers to get involved in efforts to achieve nuclear disarmament and then pursue the goal step by step while taking into account national security. The Japanese government held a meeting in Hiroshima last month. It brought together experts from nuclear and non-nuclear powers. Tanaka also attended and heard discussions that revealed a wide gap in views over nuclear arms. Until today, we are still living under the threat of more than 15,000 nuclear warheads. So, of course, we are angry as non-nuclear weapon state. And part of the challenge there is how to prevent or deter or defeat aggression beyond the declaration of something uh, as illegal comes the challenge of actually uh, enforcing it. ICANN's winning of the Nobel Peace Prize helped the Hibaksha to send their message worldwide. I want everyone to think about whether we should maintain security with nuclear weapons or hold discussions on the matter. I think that's most important. Yes, I can! Tanaka says he'll never give up and he'll keep stressing the need to realize a nuclear-free world. In Sweden, this year's other Nobel Prize laureates were presented with their awards, including Japanese-born British author Kazuo Ishiguro. The Nobel Prize is an idea that, in times like these, helps us to think beyond our dividing walls, that reminds us of what we must struggle for together as human beings. It's the sort of idea mothers will tell their small children as they always have all around the world, to inspire them and to give themselves hope. Am I happy to receive this honor? Yes, I am. Ishiguro threw back to his childhood in Japan, using the term Nobel Show to describe the Nobel Prize. He says his mother taught him what it meant. The Nobel Show, she said, was to promote heiwa, meaning peace or harmony. This was just 14 years after our city, Nagasaki, had been devastated by the atomic bomb. And young as I was, I knew Heiwa was something important. Ishiguro received his medal from Swedish King Carl Gustav. A judge for the Literature Prize praised Ishiguro for offering his readers a magnifying glass to review themselves with during a turbulent time in history.
Muslims are keeping up their angry protests over U.S. President Donald Trump's recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel. Protesters again threw stones at Israeli troops in the West Bank and the Gaza Strip. Israeli soldiers responded with tear gas and rubber bullets. Red Crescent officials say 157 people were wounded on Sunday alone. In Jerusalem, a Palestinian man stabbed and wounded an Israeli security guard at an entrance to a bus terminal. The man was arrested on the spot. His motive is not clear. Israeli military forces said Sunday they had found and destroyed a secret tunnel near the border with Gaza. They believe it was built by Palestinian militants. Muslims also kept up their protests in other countries, including Egypt, Turkey and Indonesia. In the Lebanese capital, Beirut, hundreds of people staged a pro-Palestinian rally near the U.S. Embassy. Security forces used tear gas and water cannons to subdue stone-throwing demonstrators. Turkish President Recep Tayyip Erdogan added his voice to those opposing Donald Trump's decision. We won't leave Jerusalem to the mercy of a child-murdering country. We won't leave Jerusalem to the conscience of a state that values nothing other than occupation and plunder. We will continue our struggle within law and democracy with determination. He said he would work to change Trump's decision through diplomatic channels. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu responded to Erdogan's comments. He did not hold back. I'm not used to receiving uh, um, lectures. Uh, about morality from a leader who bombs Kurdish villagers in his native Turkey, who jails journalists, who uh, helps Iran go around uh, international sanctions, and who helps terrorists, including in Gaza, uh, kill innocent people. Uh, that is not the man who is going to lecture us. Netanyahu again called the American president's decision historic and very important for peace. Japan, the U.S. and South Korea are holding a two-day naval drill to simulate tracking a North Korean ballistic missile. South Korea, the United States and Japan will hold a missile tracking exercise over two days in waters near the Korean Peninsula and Japan. According to South Korea's defense ministry, Japanese self-defense force destroyers will participate alongside those of the U.S. and South Korea. It said the fleets will practice detecting and tracking a virtual ballistic missile. The last time the three countries conducted a similar exercise was in October. Last month, the North tested what it said was a new type of intercontinental ballistic missile that could reach anywhere in the U.S. Last week, South Korea and the U.S. ran a massive joint aerial drill that included state-of-the-art U.S. stealth fighters and bombers. North Korea's official news agency had described the drill as simulating all-out war. South Korea also holds regular military drills with just the United States. Leaders in Seoul don't want next year's drills to clash with the Pyeongchang Winter Olympics and Paralympics. Sources say they're asking the U.S. to reschedule. The drills are usually held in February and March, but that would coincide with the Winter Olympics in February and Paralympics in March. Analysts say the South Korean government wants to host the Games in a period of eased tensions on the Korean Peninsula. But they also say another military provocation by North Korea before the Games would force Seoul and Washington to make a difficult decision. Prosecutors in Japan are taking over an assault case that has rocked the world of sumo. Former Yokozuna Grand Champion Haruma Fuji allegedly attacked a junior colleague in October, shedding light on the culture of the sport. Police have twice questioned Haruma Fuji over the incident. The 33-year-old admitted to striking former or fellow wrestler Takano Iwa with his hand and a karaoke remote control while they were out drinking in Totori City. He had lost his temper over the junior wrestler's attitude. The two were taking part in a regional wrestling tour in the city. 
Hadamo Fuji later retired to take responsibility and to avoid, quote, degrading the rank of Yokozuna. Now to the latest in business with Yuko Fukushima. So, Yuko, last week you talked to the chair of the WTO ministerial meeting. I think you were saying it's going to kick off over the weekend. So what's going on there? Yes, it started its meeting in Argentina on Sunday, and the WTO's head uh, opened the meeting by saying that the organization needs to change if uh, it's going to be effective in the current global environment. More on that in just a moment. In other news tonight, major Japanese companies are feeling positive about the business climate. The icon for instant noodles is making its debut on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange. And in our feature, is Japan seeing the return of the real estate bubble? But first, the WTO meeting is underway with a focus on what role the global body can play in setting rules for multilateral trade. That question is being asked because the United States is shifting priority to bilateral deals under its America First policy. The WTO's Director General, Roberto Acevedo, said the international trading system needs to become more inclusive. Sentiment today is more inward-looking. The threat of protectionism remains ever-present. And with this in mind, I think it is more important than ever that we build on the progress that we have already made to further strengthen the system. The WTO launched the Doha Round of Trade Liberalization Talks in 2001, but negotiations have stalled as divisions between rich and poor nations widened. For Japan's part, officials plan to lobby for new rules on e-commerce. They also want to reach out to their U.S. and EU counterparts to seek ways to break the deadlock in the talks. Here in Japan, corporate managers continue to express confidence about the economy. That's according to the latest government survey. Across all industries, the index of business sentiment stood at plus 6.2 in the October to December period. It's the second straight quarter in the positive. A positive figure indicates more companies feel their business has improved compared with the previous three months. The findings are based on inquiries sent to 16,000 companies nationwide. Now, government officials cite increased demand for electronics parts for smartphones as one of the factors behind the result. But managers gave more cautious views when looking ahead to the new two quarters. The forecast index for January to March next year is 5.2. For the April to June period, it slips down to 0.5. Now, one company that is expressing a lot of confidence is Japan's leading instant noodle maker. A subsidiary of Nishing Foods has debuted on the Hong Kong market as it seeks funds to expand into mainland China. Company officials struck the ceremonial gong to mark the occasion. Nishing Foods is known for its cup noodle brand. Its products are popular among Hong Kong families with no stay-at-home spouse. And they're also on the menu at casual restaurants. China's market is nearly 10 times the size of Japan's. We want to offer products that suit the lifestyles of young Chinese. Nishing also plans to use new financing to expand its business for frozen foods and snacks in mainland China. Now, on to e-commerce giant Nakten. It aims to strengthen its private lodging rental business by targeting international travelers coming to Japan. It's teaming up with Booking.com. That's the Netherlands-based operator of a website that offers reservations for hotels and other accommodations worldwide. A subsidiary, Duck Den Lingful Stay, will offer information on short-term stay properties in Japan through the Booking.com website. The collaboration will allow us to promote ourselves on the website of the world's largest online travel agency. That means more people will be able to see our rental properties and hopefully experience Japan as a result. Now to the markets in Tokyo, the Nikkei gained more than half a percent, finishing just shy of 23,000. It's the first time in a month that the index renewed its 26-year record high. Financials were in demand. That's after strong U.S. jobs data on Friday. Also, more investors are expecting the U.S. Fed to raise rates this week. That would benefit banks as they hold U.S. assets. 
In China, the Shanghai Composite jumped almost 1% to 33.22. Many money managers bought on reports the government's rules on asset management will not be as tight as initially expected. The central bank announced last month it would introduce strict rules for the industry. And to the rest of the region, same here as in Tokyo, most indexes ended in the positive led by financials. The Jakarta composite was an exception, slightly down from Friday. That's even after October retail sales came out a little better than last month. While Japan's bubble economy on the late 80s may be remembered as a time of unprecedented growth and confidence, no one can forget the buzz that followed. Now, some experts warn there is a new bubble forming in the country's housing market and history may be about to repeat itself. HK World's Tomoyuki Mineta takes a look. This man in his 30s owns a condo complex with 20 units. When he bought it, he had no money for a deposit. That didn't stop the bank lending him $1.4 million. The property delivers a return of $18,000 per year. I'm keen to buy another. I can find a good one. Banks are lending more freely. The reason? Low interest rates have made corporate loans less profitable, and low yields are shrinking returns on government bonds. So banks are targeting mortgages instead, and they are using the land and buildings as collateral. One expert is worried. Real estate serves as collateral, so lenders are eager to offer mortgages to property investors. And more investments mean higher property prices. If this cycle continues, it could lead to the kind of economic bubble Japan experienced in the late 1980s. This organization advises people who struggle to pay back their loans. It says the number is increasing. We're seeing rapid growth in problems relating to investment properties. Many investors say their mortgage payment plans fall apart one or two years after the purchase. The problem is serious in rural areas where housing is oversupplied and owners can't find enough tenants. This man in his 50s has an income of about $54,000. He took out a bank loan on an apartment building and three condo units. At first, he did well. Then he bought an apartment block in northern Tokyo. He can only fill about 60% of the unit and is now losing about $1,800 a month. He still has $1.6 million left on his loans, forcing him to cut back on expenses and dip into his savings. I got my loan so easily, like during the bubble. If the bank had said no, this wouldn't have happened. Many investors are celebrating the flow of easy money by taking out big loans on expensive properties. But some industry watchers warn that if the party gets out of hand, there could be another hangover ahead. Tomoyuki Mineta, NHK World. And that's the biz for this Monday. Issues linked to water are major challenges that rapidly growing countries in Asia Pacific face. Officials from around the region gathered in Myanmar on Monday to discuss conserving water resources and protecting against floods. Rosalind Devavalia in Bangkok has the details. 
The two-day meeting of the third Asia-Pacific Water Summit has kicked off in Yangon. The main theme is water security for sustainable development. Delegates from 22 countries took part in the meeting. Myanmar's de facto leader Aung San Suu Kyi explained how her country faces water shortages and called for international cooperation to alleviate the problem. Myanmar has abundant water resources and our hydropower potential is considerable. However, that abundance does not mean that we have water security, that we have no water scarcity. Japan's land and infrastructure minister outlined his country's role in addressing water issues. By utilizing our experience and knowledge of water disasters, Japan will keep on contributing to the sustainable development of countries in the Asia-Pacific as well as supporting the international community's peace, security and prosperity. Asia-Pacific regularly experiences severe floods and storms. Experts say climate change is increasing the risk of serious disasters. Another problem is that water supply and sewage systems in some countries are insufficient to deal with growing economies and populations. The delegates reaffirm the importance of sharing experience and technologies to minimize the impact of these problems. The meeting wraps up on Tuesday with a declaration. A rumbling volcano on Indonesia's tourist island of Bali continued belching plumes of ash over the weekend. Mount Agung erupted three weeks ago for the first time in half a century. Authorities are keeping the alert at the highest level. Local people worry about how this will impact tourism, the island's most important economic sector. NHK World's Lukman Sudarbo is in the island's central district. He's been keeping an eye on the volcano. Lukman, what's the latest? The alert status was first raised to the maximum of four in the September. It was downgraded in October for a while, but it is at the highest level again. Some 70,000 people are still living in the evacuation center after the authorities imposed an exclusive exclusion zone up to 10 kilometers from the crater. I saw women in the centers making bamboo baskets. They're having a hard time making a living. <laughs> There's so much ash around my house. I want to go back home, but I don't have the courage. Disaster management officials say 3,000 meter high volcano is quieter than it was in November, but they are still on alert for a major eruption. Life here doesn't look like it's going to be back in normal anytime soon. How is this impacting tourism? The crater is about 60 kilometers away from the popular travel spot, but the number of tourists visiting Bali is down. At popular beaches, horse-drawn carriages are sitting empty. They are usually carrying tourists around. This situation is affecting our livelihood now. I think the number of tourists has fallen by half. In November, the international airport in Bali was closed for three days when Mount Agung was spewing ash. Thousands of travelers were stranded, and tourists have been canceling their trips to Bali for Christmas and New Year. The Indonesian government estimates that the island's tourism industry will lose more than $660 million by the end of the year if Mount Agung still stays active. Bali is one of the Asia's leading tourist destinations. Five million tourists visited the island last year. Concern is mounting over how badly the smoking volcano will hurt the island's keys industry. Thank you, Lukman. That was Lukman Sudarbo. The Philippine government has erected a statue symbolizing the issue of those referred to as comfort women in the capital, Manila. The National Historical Commission erected the three-meter statue on Friday on a promenade along Manila Bay. The sculpture depicts a blindfolded woman in a traditional local costume. The inscription reads, This monument is a reminder of the Filipino women who were victims of abuses during the occupation of the Japanese forces from 1942 to 1945. The Japanese embassy in Manila has conveyed its concern to the Philippine government that the statue could affect bilateral relations. In the Philippines, people who say they were comfort women during World War II came forward in the 1990s. 
the Japanese government set up the Asian Women's Fund in 1995. It provided atonement money. But some have refused the payment and requested an official apology and compensation from Japan. That wraps up our bulletin. I'm Rosalinda Bovalia in Bangkok. On the focus tonight, democracy in Myanmar. The country has been undergoing a transition since the elections of 2015 and the sweeping victory of pro-democracy parties. Aung San Suu Kyi came to power, ushering in what many hoped would be a new era for democracy. Two years later, another crisis has caught the world's attention, the plight of Rohingya refugees. The international community struggles to understand why the Nobel Peace Prize laureate seems unable to address it. For more on this, we turn to our senior commentator, Aiko Doden. Aiko, great to have you with us. Thank you for having me tonight. Now, one key person who's been following events from inside Myanmar is a legendary activist called Matida. Matida wears three hats, surgeon, writer and activist. Nowadays, she spends most of her time editing a magazine that promotes democracy and freedom of expression. When Aung San Suu Kyi stood up for democracy against the military government in 1988, Matida was still a student and worked as her close aide. She was jailed for six years on charges for endangering public peace. Matida's relentless quest for democracy has led many to see in her Myanmar's next democracy leader. I had a chance to interview her in Yangon in 2014. And last week, uh, we sat down again, this time in Kyoto, and discussed the future of democracy. When I covered you, um, your activities in 2014, uh, you were volunteering, I think, at a hospital outside Yangon, seeing patients for free. Um, and you were also seeing patients at the Muslim Free Hospital. Um, why was it that you chose to see the Muslim hospital? Well, I work for Muslim hos uh, Free Hospital from uh, 92 to 93, just before I was arrested, and again after I was released from 1999 till 2008. That's all, because uh, at that time, you know, I cannot be the government servant. I cannot work at the state hospital because of my political background. There was only one free hospital <laughs> who can welcome me as a dissident doctor writer is a Muslim free hospital. When it comes to the most current challenge that Myanmar is facing, like the issue related to the Rohingya people, um, it does seem, as you have written in your book, that the dictatorship has taught people that the, the problems are only solved through um, violent approaches. Well, that's, I used to say, even though people are saying they're longing for and looking for freedom, they don't really understand what it is. Mm -hmm. Until and unless you cannot defend and protect the rights of the others, these rights cannot be established. Mm -hmm. We try to gain the social harmony back into the society mm -hmm. by uh, learning each other, teaching each other, so and so. Mm -hmm. But it will take time. It cannot be corrected. That's why I think the uh, external intervention is, is it should be constructive. Constructive meaning? Constructive meaning not making the other minorities people or the majority people vulnerable in the sense of the uh, blaming. Hmm. Matida's concern is that international criticism over Rohingya crisis may further radicalize Buddhist hardliners and create additional rifts in an already fragmented society. I think the international media and the international community also suffering lack of information about Myanmar. Mm -hmm. Then they cannot dig enough to the context of this issue. 
the history, the border area, the history of the race and religion in this area, the border uh, crisis. The, the, this Bangladesh-Burmese border is pretty much porous. Mm. I asked Matida what she thinks of Aung San Suu Kyi, and in particular, mounting criticism against the former mentor she refers to as Do Su. I might sound very harsh, but um, you said uh, dictatorship does not have to come from military. Um, I suppose dictatorship means something with a big authority, very powerful. Um, some people think uh, perhaps Do Su is very powerful, that Myanmar people sometimes do not have to think much. Well, yeah, that's my concern. In the past, we have a very clear sense of common enemy. We can just simply say the military roots, the, the military regime is illegitimate. Now they gain the legitimacy already through this process of mm. the election, so mm. and so, constitution. Right now, I think a lot of our people having very big identity crisis. Mm -hmm. They think uh, finding the security through the powerful people or the authority, powerful authority, is the way they can be okay or safe. That's the basic uh, concept after the long-term dictatorship. Mm. Um, is Myanmar today the country you had envisioned even while you were imprisoned? <sighs> Indeed not. I, I might say my ultimate destination is to have everyone of my country to be totally independent and uh, respect the basic human rights and mutual understanding among each other. This is the very early part of the transition to democracy. Hmm. So Aiko um, Matida was raising many concerns about her country, yes. but what mm -hmm. is she most concerned about? Well, um, she's obviously concerned that the military still retain control over politics in Myanmar. But she's equally concerned about the people's general mindset, uh, meaning you know, she believes the regime's decision to ease some restrictions in, on freedom of expression suddenly led people to vent fear, anger and hatred. And in some cases, this led to hate speech or extreme violences. I think this context and the fact that the Myanmar is undergoing a transition can serve to explain, um, at least in part, uh, what's happening with the Rohingya. Uh, but of course, Martida uh, is subtle about it uh, because it's a highly sensitive issue. So now, how do you think Martida will try to improve the situation so she can bring on the kind of democracy she envisions? Well, uh, Martida thinks the right to information is the key to freedom of expression. She's currently working with civil society and rights organizations uh, to pass a bill in this direction. Uh, she knows that she alone cannot uh, bring about change overnight. Uh, the fact that she's working with grassroots organizations suggests that Martida wants to be part of larger civil movement rather than being uh, perceived as the uh, next Aung San Suu Kyi. Uh, in that sense, what she and her group collectively achieve in the future can be perhaps seen as a barometer for Myanmar's democracy. Thank you, Aiko. Thank you. <music> Japanese baseball star Shohei Otani is a hit with the American media. The 23-year-old do-it-all sensation told reporters he wants to bring success to his new team, the Los Angeles Angels. Hi, my name is Shohei Otani. I am thankful to many people now that I'm starting my career as a major leaguer. I'll work to win the championship with the support of our fans. Otani's agent announced on Friday that the two-way player had decided to sign with the Angels. More than 20 ball clubs had expressed interest.
I picked the angels because I felt a connection with them. I had wonderful talks with all the teams I spoke to. I don't want to talk about their good points or bad points. Otani says he's looking forward to getting on the mound and in the batter's box. It's time for World Weather with our meteorologist, Sai Kamari. Hello, Sai Ka. Hello. It was a windy but relatively warm in Tokyo today, mm -hmm. but it seems up north in Japan is experiencing, experiencing a lot of snow. What's the latest? Yeah, that's right. It's a mix back here in Japan. We saw quite beautiful weather here in Tokyo, but across the north, we are looking at heavy snowfall plus strong winds. Now, parts of the Kanto region had a high of about 18 degrees. It was more like early November, but across the north, we've got about 30 centimeters of snowfall in just 24 hours. Asahikawa has had 14 centimeters of snowfall. Now we have some video coming out of Asahikawa. A rapidly intensifying storm and cold air are causing blowing snow in northern Japan. Heavy snow, wind, wave warnings are in place. In Hokkaido, on top of snow and winds, a possible tornado has been reported. Authorities are advising people to watch out for avalanches as well as slippery roads. Now, snow will likely continue into Wednesday in many places and possibly into Thursday. Strong northerly winds will be flowing into much of Japan, so even Tokyo will see cool temperatures tomorrow and we will see heavy sea effect snowfall on the Sea of Japan side of the nation. Now, some areas like Tohoku and Hokuriku may see up to 70 centimeters of snowfall and then gusts could hit as much as 126 kilometers per hour. The combination will cause very low visibility making for very hazardous driving conditions and waves are going to be very high as well. Now as for temperatures, tomorrow's high in Tokyo was 16, tomorrow's high only 11 degrees with the morning low of only 2 degrees so do bundle up. And as for Sapporo, snow weather will likely continue into Thursday at least and it'll stay severe all day. On Tuesday in Sapporo, it's actually 9 degrees colder compared to what we saw on Monday. By the way, in Tokyo, tomorrow's humidity could be 25 degrees. So moisturize your skin and also watch out when you use fire. The average or actually ideal humidity is about 40 to 60 percent. That's for the rest of Asia, down to the single digit in Shanghai and minus 4 for the daytime high in Seoul and right at the freezing point in Beijing on Tuesday. Now, talking about cold air, we are looking at very, very low temperatures across Western Europe because of heavy snowfall and sub zero temperatures. Hundreds of flights have been canceled in uh, Frankfurt, and also some flights have been delayed in the Netherlands. And a uh, ferry ran aground because of high waves in France. Now, we saw the heaviest snowfall in four years in parts of the UK. Now, frigid cold air will affect Western Europe, and that will cause heavy snowfall even in the northern areas of the Iberian Peninsula. And not just snowfall, heavy rain is on the menu for the peninsula in the southern locations that could lead to flooding and wet and windy weather will likely spread to the north and east. Parts of Germany could see gusts reaching 180 kilometers per hour. So Hurricane-like strong winds are anticipated over the country on Monday. Now the temperatures are going to be as follows on your Tuesday, 5 in Berlin with rainy weather. Then Paris will see sunny weather but the high will be 5. London about 5 degrees colder than average for this time of year. All right, that's for me. Have a nice day. And once again, the headlines. The anti-nuclear weapons group ICANN has received the Nobel Peace Prize, accompanied by an A-bomb survivor. Muslims are keeping up angry protests against the U.S. president's decision to recognize Jerusalem as Israel's capital. 
Japan, the U.S. and South Korea are holding a naval drill to simulate tracking a North Korean ballistic missile. People on the Indonesian island of Bali are growing more concerned about the impact of a volcano on tourism. And that's it for today's Newsroom Tokyo. I'm Hideki Nakayama. And I'm Aki Shibuya. Coming up next, NHK World's interview program, Direct Talk. Stay with us.